Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, especially uh, Aslan and Bobak, for inviting me here to this wonderful workshop. So uh, my name is Prakash. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with my former PhD student, uh, Nanma, uh, who is uh, now in the industry uh, for many years. Uh, so I'm not a communication complexity person per se. I come from a very different background. I come from information theory. So I want to share the information theoretic perspective on some of the problems in communication complexity, focusing on the two terminal problem, although we have some other work on multi-terminal problems as well. So the, before I get into this uh, slides, um, I'm going to structure this talk into three parts, roughly. In the first part, I just want to set up the problem very clearly, so that, uh, because I know that there are people from uh, the CS community as well as from information theory. So we just want to make sure that we have the right assumptions and the right uh, formulation. And then um, I want to immediately state the results. So I want to start by stating the results and then spend some time actually explaining to you the mechanics of how to use those results for specific problems. Hopefully, uh, we will work out a problem on the board which you can then go back and use it uh, for doing the deriving your own expressions for other problems. And then, uh, depending on how much time I have, I will explain the story of the results about how we got to those uh, results and then conclude with some open problems and some similarities and differences between uh, communication complexity and uh, information theoretic formulation of it. So let's get started. Uh, the familiar problem, uh, there are two terminals, A and B. Um, the terminals observe uh, n samples of some source. So in information theory, we think of these uh, inputs as coming uh, from some joint distribution, uh, the distribution assumption on inputs, as has been mentioned before. And uh, the goal is that the terminals exchange messages uh, over some multiple rounds of communication, at the end of which uh, they produce estimates for every single sample of the source. So as opposed to communication complexity where the final answer is just a zero or a one, for example, here there's an answer for every sample. So it's a repeated computation, or in other words, an amortized uh, sort of variation of you know, communication complexity. So uh, to be more specific, so we have x1, y1, x2, y2, and x and yn, n samples. They're drawn from independent and identically distributed random variables with some joint distribution uh, denoted by pxy. Everything is a finite alphabet in this talk. Then um, the definition of uh, codes in information theory is the following. Uh, n is the number of samples, as we have uh, denoted here, and t is the number of messages that are exchanged in a code. So code is specified by ma deterministic mappings from uh, the history that has been observed into a point and the source samples into a message for the next round. So that's the definition of a code in, uh, in this context here. The rate, as was alluded to by Sasha in during the break, uh, the rate is of quantity of interest in information theory. So the rate is the rate of computation. In other words, the number of bits that are exchanged per sample of the, uh, per sample computed, essentially. So in other words, if you exchange total number of B bits and you divide it by N samples, that's defined as the rate of communication. And the computation is not required to be perfect. So there is a chance that after you communicated uh, your information, you might still not get a perfect reconstruction. So there's a probability of error. The error probability is defined as making an error even in one computation. So even if you got one sample incorrectly computed, you declare it as an error event. So it's a block sort of uh, computational error. So more formally, uh, this is a more formal definition of the error. It's a chance that there exists an index from 1 through n which is incorrectly computed at the end of this uh, uh, communication. So this is the uh, setup in information theory. And what's the goal? The goal is to understand the ultimate limits, meaning uh, what is the minimum number of bits or uh, per sample that you need to uh, get asymptotically reliable communication. Asymptotically meaning, if you allowed the block length and number of samples to grow to infinity, on the average, the, what's the rate, how small rate can you get it to make the probability of error go to zero? So let me state it more clearly. So the, the T message rate is the smallest um, asymptotically optimum rate, meaning that it's the smallest rate you need 
in order to ensure that you can successfully compute uh, all the samples correctly with high probability, with probability going to one as the block length goes to infinity. The block length here refers to the number of samples. And uh, here, the interesting thing is that the number of messages T is fixed. So in communication complexity, you typically optimize over the protocol, which may result in a number of messages which depends on the inputs, uh, which may depend uh, on the, the source distribution. So here, we fix the number of messages T uh, and then uh, essentially allow the number of samples to go to infinity, and then you send the number of messages to infinity. So in other words, uh, the T message rate is defined as the smallest rate you can get for a family of codes, uh, which as you go along the family of codes, the probability of error goes to zero. Yeah. Yeah, it's a deterministic thing. So you, you, I give you T, like I want five messages. You fix it. Uh, you're allowed to increase the number of samples you look at. So, so you're actually you're allowed to wait until? Yeah, forever. You can make, and, uh, and, uh, and the end. And then, then, do the then communicate, essentially. So you may have infinite number of samples. I mean, asymptotically, you might have to go to a very large number of uh, samples. But then once you collect all the samples, then you can start the communication. But you only use T messages. So the question is, as you, so the, so the, the flexibility allowed here is the, uh, the block length. So that's the degree of freedom, which is allowed here. And you want to understand what is the minimum rate you can get to get asymptotically error-free computation, but using only T messages. But the ultimate limit is when you take t and send t to infinity. So in other words, the infinite message rate, which is what I refer to as the ultimate limits of uh, two-terminal computation, is the limit of this expression as t goes to infinity. So we want to understand, uh, can we compute this? Is there any hope for providing and like, characterizing this in the first place? And secondly, can you even compute it explicitly for specific problems, right? Yes. So I just understand. So if you didn't, like, this R infinity may be larger than the rate that you can achieve, you just have no restriction on the number of samples. that may be the order of limits. Yes. So that's a very important question you're asking. And in fact, one of the open problems I'm going to state. There's a technical technicality here about order of limits. So here we are sending n to infinity first, and then sending t to infinity. The question is, if you do not allow that, if you allow t and n to go to infinity in some way, jointly, is the answer still going to be the same? The answer is I don't know. So that's the difference. So, so it, may, it, may be larger. it could be larger. But I don't know of an example, and nor do I know of a proof which shows that it is not larger. OK. So. Um, Yeah, it's a each for each each sample you give. I get an x sample here. I get a y sample here. For that pair, I want to compute a function. So think of and function. Think of and. I want to repeatedly compute and for every sample. And how does t come? I just fix the number of messages I'm allowed to exchange. Oh, okay. So you are allowed to only exchange two messages or three messages. How many other messages you specify in advance? Yeah, that's an error. So the moment you make one, even one sample is incorrectly computed, that's an error. It doesn't matter whether you computed all of those correctly. So it's an error for the, like, it's a very kind of worst case kind of error, meaning in that sense. That is, even if one sample. So the block means, like, I have n samples as a block. So if I make a mistake of even one sample in the block, the whole thing is considered an error. So this is called as, in the, in, in the information theory parlance, this is called as block error probability, as opposed to a sample error probability. Now, the important, yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, I should, yeah, so, yeah, so here, here, basically. So you, you exchange, say, 100 bits, 
but you ended up making 1,000 computations with those 100 bits. So the bits per computation is 100 divided by 1,000. So that's a measure that is used in information theory. It's, a, it's just a metric that is used. It's, a, it's a amortized. So you're amortizing the cost, the communication cost, over all the samples you have computing. But it looks rather similar to, to, to the amortized cost yeah. of computation. It is. Which is converged to an information complexity. Yes. So I will come to that point towards the very end, because there are a lot of similarities. But as uh, Anoop mentioned, there are some subtleties also about the order in which the limits are taken. And that's an important question to resolve maybe at some point. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, this, this could be many bits. Each message could be many number of bits. But I'm going to take the total number of bits exchanged and amortize it by n. So you take the, uh, you add up the number of bits in the first message, the second message, and third message. Take all the bits you've exchanged. You divide it by, you divide it by the number of samples, and that's your rate, total uh, rate. You could also ask another question, which is, uh, I want to know the rate for every message, and characterize all the t tuples of rates. We have answered that question too, but I didn't want to get into that in this talk. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's all, I'm not sure it's obvious it's going to be higher. Okay, so uh, I would say the, the the most general case is when you don't put any restriction on how these limits are sent. That is, you have two parameters: the number of messages t and the number of uh, samples n, and they both have to go to infinity. Uh, uh, you could you could make them go to infinity many ways. Uh, in this uh, formulation, we fix the number of messages t first, send n to infinity, and then you send t to infinity. And, and you don't think it's that this is higher than yeah. Higher. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Yes, yes, I do not know the answer to that question. Yes, sorry, I've been, yeah. Yeah, you get all the n samples at the beginning of time. So uh, everything here, so this is time zero. This is time zero. This is time one, time two. You can think of time as number of messages. So everything is available b at the beginning. It is like that, yeah. Yes. yes. So I will come back to the, the connections between uh, communication complexity in this a little bit more later. But I want to focus on conveying my uh, side of the story, which is the information theory side of the story first. Right? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, yeah. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, here, the output is there are n outputs essentially. Yeah. Uh, essentially, each uh, sample is computed separately. In other words, uh, as it's not a it's not a multi it's not a multivariable output. So it's not like uh, like set disjointness where you have n things and you essentially put still zero or one at the end. But there's one output for every sample. Okay. So the important uh, thing I want to uh, emphasize now is that this number this uh, t message limit or the infinite message limit is a functional of the joint distribution, clearly. So uh, different sources, distributions will have different uh, you know, uh, efficiencies of computation. So we want to characterize that. We want to characterize that quantity as a functional of the source PMF, or the joint source distribution. So how do we do that? So in the next few slides, which is the first part of the talk, I'm going to just give you uh, the answer, the answer to that question, and also give you sort of a, a procedure which may not be computational, computable in the strict computational sense, but at least to a practical algorithm at least to compute it. And in many cases, I can give you explicit closed form analytic solutions for many classes of problems, uh, functions. Now, another interesting thing is that the functions can be different. That is to say that. The two terminals don't have to compute the same function. That's another difference between the classical studies in communication complexity I've seen. Most of the work assume that both sides want the same function. But uh, you could have a situation where different sides can have different functions. Okay, so one side wants to compute and, the other one wants to compute or. Okay, it could be different. So how do we characterize that? So let me uh, focus uh, 
I'm going to focus pretty much on this class of functions because it's, we have nice answers to this uh, particular class of functions. It also helps to illustrate all the ideas very clearly. So Boolean functions, so binary inputs, uh, binary outputs. Uh, let's consider a case where the computation is desired only at terminal B, meaning that Alice doesn't care if she gets anything. She only wants to help Bob to compute the function. Okay, so the question is, uh, what can we say about this problem? Well, here is a list of all the 16 Boolean functions, right? There are, you know, 16 possible Boolean functions, so I have paired them. Uh, this is one of the functions, and this is a complement of the function, so they come in pairs. And uh, obviously, you have the constant functions. If you have a constant function, clearly you don't have to send anything. The rate is zero, right? And the number of messages is zero. The identity function for x. So in other words, uh, Bob wants to learn exactly what Alice has got completely. Information theory tells you that the optimum rate of communication is simply the entropy, the entropy of x, okay, which is a, denoted by h2 of p here. So what is h2 of p? h2 of p is this function here. It's minus p log p minus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. And it has this nice shape. If this axis is the p axis, that's the binary entropy function. This is what explicit closed form expression for the binary entropy function is. So that's also clear. And in this case, you can do it with one message. Alice simply communicates one message to Bob, end of story. You can't do anything better than that. Obviously, the, other, the y identity is trivial. Again, nothing has to be sent, because Bob already has y. And uh, in that case, the message again is 0, and the rate is 0. But now comes uh, a few more interesting problems, XOR. Now clearly, if Bob has the XOR of X and Y and knows Y, essentially he knows X. So it's equivalent to the problem of getting X. So again, the rate for XOR is the same as the rate for X identity, which is H2 of P here. Now comes a, sort of the most kind of interesting function in this class, which is the AND function. So if you want to compute the AND, uh, we can compute a closed form explicit closed form expression for this, it turns out. So I will show you to the next slide. So we have, we have an explicit closed form expression. I'm calling it AND1 because this is for the, the case when only Bob wants to compute AND. If both Alice and Bob want to compute AND, the answer is different. The expression changes. And it turns out the number of messages can be anything between 0 to infinity depending on the value of the source distribution. There are some trivial source distributions where you don't have to send anything, and then there are other difficult source distributions where you might have to send infinite number of messages. Okay, so it's a number between zero to infinity. No, no, no. You can have the whole zoo, zero, one, two, three. But, uh, but here's the thing, I want to uh, say that. Uh, I do not know yet, another open problem, an explicit uh, example of a source distribution where you can prove that you will need exactly infinite number of messages. But experiments suggest that it has to be infinite. So you mentioned that if A also wants to compute, uh, you can then it's a different expression. It's a different expression. I'll come to that next slide. With this rate plus one, like it's not plus one. Because it's like n samples. It's not like the case of uh, you know, communication complexity where one side computes it and then you just send one bit over and that's the end of the story. No. Nope. You have n, n bits to send over. <laughs> so it's one, it's, uh, it's, yeah. It's not, it, it's not rate. This is messages. No, but rate is not more than one. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Sure. So these expressions are typically less than one. So these are all numbers less than one. For example, look at the binary entropy function. The maximum is one, but it's typically less than one. Yeah. This column is t, which is the number of messages. Yeah. Then the the minimum number of messages. Yes. So the question is, how can you achieve this? Can you achieve it with one message or two messages or three messages? 
So it turns out that uh, it turns out that in the case of this function, you need obviously you need at least one function. Yes, 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 exactly. Yes. So if you allow more messages, you can do more, right? But it turns out that in some cases you don't need to go to infinite messages, even if three messages are optimum. So you, even having more messages will not give you better rate. It depends on the source distribution. Yeah. But for the classical communication complex, if you just want to compute, it, it seems to correspond to the problem of computing the intersection of two sets of given yes. sizes on one end. Yeah. And so for, for the classical model, is this something known or for, for this specific problem? For the classic. You have the, you have a standard communication complexity model. You need to compute the intersection of two yep. sets of given yep. sizes sure. and on, on one end. Yeah. So that more or less looks yes. like this. Yes. Yes. So but but amortized amortized over n n of them. Yeah. No, no, so no, we yeah. Can compute just sets yeah. I understand. That says the joint. Yeah. Yeah. So is it something known about this or just the, the here the, the here if you are choosing and random. Actually, I don't know. So I'm not a communication complexity expert. So I'm here to learn. Um, anyways, uh, the point is that uh, you have explicit closed form solutions for all these. Okay, uh, for all the Boolean functions, if you want to compute only that function at one end, okay, you can also do it for the other case when you want to compute the same function at both ends, which is like more like the traditional communication complexity case. The, the, uh, the things in red are the ones which are different. They look, the expressions look different from the ones for the previous problem. Uh, in other words, uh, for example, if you want to compute, obviously, the uh, y identity uh, at, at both ends, then clearly you need to send uh, y also at some point, right? So you need to get at least h of q uh, bits across. And if you want to compute x or r at both ends, you essentially, you have to exchange the two sources completely. So you have to send all the information from A to B and B to A. And so you need to send the entropy of X and the entropy of Y. And that is the total rate you need. Okay? And the expression for AND2 is different than for AND1, it turns out. So now on the next slide, I'm going to show you the expressions. And I'm going to show you the expressions for these two things. These are explicit closed form expressions for these problems. So I'm going to call it example two because uh, both sides want to compute the AND function of all the source inputs. This is the explicit closed form expression. Okay? It turns out it's a, functional, it's a function of the source distribution, obviously, as I mentioned. It depends on the source distribution, P and Q. So it's all in terms of uh, quantities we know, meaning the binary entropy function, which I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, log q and so forth. So for all p which is less than q, this expression holds and is symmetric. So if you want uh, for q less than p, you interchange the roles of essentially uh, you know, x and y, and you can get the corresponding symmetric uh, thing. So you have an expression for the uh, AND function. The expression now changes if you want the AND function at only one side. So the rate could be only be smaller, right? Because uh, uh, yeah, so when I say, uh, yeah, less than half. No, actually, no, uh, this is uh, true for all P and Q. Yeah, so, but I think this, the expression is also symmetric in that sense, right? So if you, for example, interchange P and Q. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's true. It's true for even uh, general P less than Q, but we can chat more offline. Yeah. Uh, so now the expression for uh, AND1, it's almost the same. So the expression, if you look here, which I drew here, is almost the same as the expression I had, except that this is a factor of 2 here, 2q, 1 minus 2q. So it's less than the previous expression. And the range for which it's valid, as you pointed out, the half comes here, essentially here. So p less than q less than half, and uh, the symmetric expression for q less than p less than half. And then uh, it turns out for p, uh, for this range, uh, it's a different expression. And finally, if Q is greater than half, irrespective of P, irrespective of the source, the first source's distribution, if Q is uh, greater than half, you have to essentially send the whole source across. You have to essentially send 
the entire X source across to the other side, which is the entropy of the X source, which is P, H of P. So this is the expression. So I just want to show you that, yes, there are expressions now we can compute. Now I want to tell you the, how do you do this? I mean, uh, some properties which allow you to compute some of these expressions. And then I want to work out some example on the board to see the mechanics of doing this. And then in the final part of the talk, depending on how much time I have, I will uh, explain sort of outline the main steps which uh, brings you to those results, okay? So, Yeah, we can show the exist codes. Like, so, so like in information theory, all these uh, arguments are uh, like in the probabilistic methods. Like there exists codes which can get you to these kind of expressions. In some cases, there are trivial ways of doing it. Uh, in other cases, you don't know. Do you have insight on why in the last case you set all Okay, insight in a certain sense. As it will become clear from this uh, framework, it may not be insight in the way you might think it is. Okay, so uh, let me first give you the general result, uh, which is true for any uh, functions and for any uh, you know distributions. So the T message rate uh, is a functional of the joint distribution that I've told you, and it also depends on the function f and g. So let's fix let's fix the functions f and g for now, and just view it as a functional of the source distribution. Okay. Now. Clearly, there are some source distributions for which uh, it's trivial. You don't have to send anything. You can compute the functions trivially without having any messages exchanged. Those will be like very trivial distributions. So let me define the zero message, the zero message rate, as a rate uh, when you don't have to send anything. Okay. So it's so it's a, it's a function which is zero for those distributions for those distributions where it's trivial. Okay. And for those distributions where it's not possible to compute it, I'm defining the rate to be infinity. So it's a definition. So infinity means it's in, in, infeasible. You cannot compute it with zero messages. Okay, you have to send at least some information across. Now I'm going to introduce this quantity called as the rate reduction functional. So what is the rate reduction functional? It is the rebate in the rate you get compared to exchanging sources, right? The, if you have to simply exchange the two sources, you have to spend a certain number of bits in exchanging it. This is an exact expression uh, you need. The uh, entropy of the first source condition on the second source is the amount of bits you have to send from X to A to B to reproduce X completely at the other side. The second term is the entropy of Y given X, which is the rate you will need to send uh, the Y source to, uh, from B to A. So that's the rate you will need uh, to exchange sources or reproduce the sources. If you want to compute a function, obviously one way to compute a function is to exchange the sources and then compute it. So really, if you want to compute a function, the rate can only be smaller than that, right? So the difference between this expression here, which is also a functional of PXY, and this expression here is what I'm defining as the rate reduction functional. <coughs> so it's, a funct it's also a functional of PXY, but it just gives you the rebate. So you can define this for every T message. So for T message rate, you have a T message rate reduction functional. Now here's a basic result, and I will illustrate this through the example of the AND function and so forth. So what is the result? It says that we can characterize the infinite message rate reduction functional immediately, the entire functional in one shot. So what is this infinite message? So what is the row infinity? Row infinity is the least element of the set. So what is the set? It's a set of functionals. So it is the least element of the following set of functionals. Consider a set of functionals which are the following three properties. Okay, first property is that the functionals in this family are always above the zero message rate reduction functional. So if you evaluate the rate reduction functional for zero messages, you have a certain rate reduction functional. Okay? So all functionals which are above it, it's one property. So it will be above it. The second property is a, uh, kind of a little bit hard to understand, but it will become clearer when I focus on independent sources. 
I can write the joint distribution of uh, x, y as p of x times p y given x, or also as p x given y times p of y. Now, if I were to fix the conditionals and view this as purely a function of the marginals, right? Then this fun these functions have to be concave with respect to each of them. So if I fix p of y given x and I change p of x, this functional is a concave functional with respect to p of x. So if I fix px given y and I change py, it's a concave functional with respect to py. So in other words, it's a biconcave functional. It's a biconcave functional. And to be more precise, it'll be marginally biconcave because it's concave with respect to only the marginals. So all functionals which have these three properties is one family of functionals. It's not empty, we can prove it, because it at least it's got row zero. No, we can prove it's not empty. So the least element of this family exists, it's unique, and is the infinite message rate reduction functional. Okay, so that's the result. So let me illustrate that through an example. So let me illustrate uh, this entire uh, result through an example, and it'll kind of uh, hopefully clarify what's going on here. So let's focus on the AND function computation only at one end, only at Bob's end. So we start with uh, t equals zero, meaning no, zero messages. Clearly, you cannot compute the AND function for any arbitrary distribution, only for some distributions, right? So when is the AND function uh, possible, when is it possible to compute the AND trivially at Bob's end without knowing x? So what choices? So let's assume that they're independent. So let's assume that the sources x and y are independent, and x is Bernoulli p, and y is Bernoulli q. So there are only two numbers which completely parameterize uh, the joint distribution, p and q. Okay, so the point is, uh, for what set of, so here's the uh, p axis, here's the q axis. So for some choice of p and q, it's possible to compute the AND function without any messages. So for, for what are they? Clearly, when p times q is equal to zero, right? If, I, if at least one of them is zero, you wrote trivially the exact value of the other one, you don't understand anything. So either p is zero, so uh, when p is zero, you have this, or q is zero, you have this. So the blue lines show the boundaries of the distributions where it's possible. And the other case is when p is equal to 1. If p is equal to 1, then x is equal to 1, with probability 1. And then the AND is simply y. So y is, is the answer itself. So that's p is equal to 1, p equals 1. So the point is that this is the sort of the bounded distributions on which it is possible to compute the AND function trivially without any messages. And for all of the distributions, it's impossible. So I'm going to define the rate reduction functional to be zero at these points and infinity at this point, all of the points here. Now let's compute the rate reduction functional for this problem. So the rate reduction is given by this, entropy of x given y plus y given x minus this, but since x and y are independent here, so it's simply the entropy of p plus entropy of q minus the rate reduction functional. So the expression is simply going to be the following. Because it is zero here, it becomes HP plus HQ minus zero, which is HP plus HQ. So for all these distributions here, it's going to be HP plus HQ. And for all of the distributions, it's going to be minus infinity. Minus infinity. So let me show you what it looks like. Remember that this was the boundary on which it's possible to compute. So the rate reduction function is going to be HP plus HQ on the boundary. Now, important thing to note is that the binary entropy function is zero uh, when the argument is either zero or one, okay? So that's for here it's simply going to be HQ, here it's going to be HQ, and here it's going to be HP, okay? So this is what the shape of the, bond, the rate reduction function looks like uh, in this case. And it's going to be minus infinity here. Okay, so now I've described to you the zero message rate reduction functional. And now I'm going to tell you the infinite message rate reduction function from this. At q equal 1, we already know that we need to distinguish after that. So you can also draw the, the H, HP curve at q equal to 1, right? 
Mm -hmm. Wait, q equals one. Yeah, but uh, but it is Bob who needs to know the and function. Yeah, Bob Bob's input is one. Yeah, but Bob doesn't know what Alice has. Yeah, so, so the infinite weight is entropy of x. So this curve, this part oh. of the curve is fine now. So that's the, what you are no, saying. No, the last. Oh, you mean this one? That, that you can also draw it because you have to know. No, no. Uh, you don't. Because it's computing and, and y is always one. So you're computing and and y is always one. Then you but but the number of messages is not necessarily going to be equal to one, right? You can maybe send maybe Bob can send some information to Alice, which can help reduce the rate to be sent back. But it needs to know at the end of the rate. Needs yeah, it needs to know the end. Agreed. But what is the rate? It's unknown. It's Why? Because it needs to compute the entity function. No, but that's not an argument, right? So you are just saying that it needs to compute. X dot y is x. X dot y is x. But if you, so my, my, the whole point of this computation is to figure out what is the infinite message limit. You are telling me that you know the answer, but I'm saying how do you know the answer? You could give side information. Yeah, you could give side information. I'm just saying that I'm not saying what you're saying. I'm just saying that one more boundary is obvious, I think, but I could be wrong. No, it is, it's not true in this case. It turns out. Yeah, let's see. No, wait, 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 so, wait, uh, oh, you're saying the rate reduction function is HQ, you're saying? Yeah, it, uh, when Q is it's HP or Not the rate reduction, just No, no, no okay. Oh, you're saying, oh, you're saying the, the rate is uh, HQ. Yeah, rate would be HP and the other one Q. Yeah, I think that's probably true. That's yeah. probably true. So but, you will see, but you don't need to worry about that because you will get, that the you will get, you will get this from this calculation true. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Let's see how, yeah, so I was thinking you're talking about the rate reduction yeah. function. So you're talking about the rate itself, okay. Yes, rate itself. Yeah, okay. Yes. So uh, here's the characterization I told you. So it's a function of two variables, p and q. So it is the smallest functional which is sitting above. So it's the smallest function which is sitting above this curve, which is concave with respect to p for every q and concave with respect to q with for every p. Okay. So this is the characterization of the infinite message rate reduction function. So let me show you the picture. So that's a, one example of, of a function. That's a function which is in the family, which is biconcave with respect to p and q, and is sitting above those uh, blue curves. So it is uh, one element in the family. Here's another element in the family, and so forth. So the, the least element in this family is the answer. The least element in that family of uh, dist functionals is the infinite message rate reduction functional. OK? Point-wise, yeah. For every point, if you pick any point here, this functional is lower than any other functionals in the family. So that's the characterization. In fact, this leads to also an algorithm, quote unquote algorithm of computing this functional. How do you do this? You start with a zero message rate reduction functional, then concaveify along p, then concaveify along q, and keep repeating this. Okay? So it turns out you can show that by doing this, you will converge to the infinite message rate reduction functional. So let me show you that through an example. So here's the uh, construction. So supposing at any stage, at any stage, you have say t equals one. So you have a zero message rate reduction functional. Now as you can see, this particular functional here, this is not concave with respect to p or q, right? Because you have minus infinity in the middle here. So if I go from here, you're going to a minus infinity and coming back, it's not concave, it's convex maybe, but not concave. Okay, it's concave. So it's not concave. So if I look at the kind of a slice of this uh, picture here, the, uh, what I'm showing you there is a slice. So you, what is showing you is a slice of that picture. So at some stage, you might get a, a red curve, which is like sort of the zero message uh, rate reduction function, for example. It is not concave with respect to p. Okay, so you concaveify it. What do you mean by concaveify it? You find the convex hull of the of the of the uh, hypograph of this function, okay, the convex hull of the hypograph is function, and that's this blue curve shown here. Yeah. No. Uh, 
there's a there is a time sharing aspect to it but not in the sense of the code construction itself uh, it is uh, like a sub problem viewpoint meaning that if i knew one uh, if i if i condition on one message it becomes if i have a t messages if i condition on the first message it becomes a t minus 1 message problem and right time sharing so p is a parameter so this is p is fixed for any time sharing so it doesn't look yeah it's not a time sharing in the code sense it's it, it you're, you're kind of taking the convex hull across all distributions of p so it's not yeah so here's here's how you would do the iterative algorithm you start with uh, the zero message uh, functional and then say you see that it is not concave with respect to the p direction so you fix q and concavify it with respect to the p direction so you might do something like this like doing this kind of procedure you get a surface like this you get a surface like this now you see that it's concave with respect to the p direction it's not concave with respect to the q direction anymore right so you can do the same thing right and then keep doing this and it will ultimately converge to the infinite message limit which is the infinite message uh, reduction functional okay so this is this is something which you can uh, you can show so i'm running i think I've, how much time do i have 10 minutes so in the time i have i'm just going to be able to convey to you the the mechanics of the result and uh, the the, uh, the the machinery which led to the result will have to just uh, talk to me offline okay in the interest of time so yeah so now if you just look at the gallery of these functions so here's the zero message reduction reduction functional one message two message in fact every concavification corresponds to sending a message from one end to the other so if you concavify with respect to p you know, it's like a is sending a message from a to b then if you concavify with respect to, uh, to uh, q for every p you're sending a message from b to a so this actually corresponds to every message being sent from one side to the other now uh, what you notice is that if i look at certain points for example if you look at certain uh, values of p and q and if you look at the way the rate reduction function changes okay you can see that for some some distributions there's no change meaning that uh, zero message is optimum or one message is optimum and for others you get optimum after two messages for example the one shown here after two messages no change so meaning for those distributions two messages are optimum you don't get any benefit by sending more than two messages and but there are some distributions like the one shown here where it seems that uh, you get benefit by going on and on and on forever but i don't have a proof that it actually will be the case so that's one of the open problems i would say to uh, to study to actually show that uh, some distributions are like those you will actually need infinite messages uh, no finite number of concavification will ever get you to the final answer here okay Rho t. This is rho. But you get RT from here. RT is equal to you just subtract out that thing, yeah. That's correct. So it's, so it's even optimal at each stage. Yes. This is optimal at every stage. At every stage. So this gives you in fact the whole thing. For it gives you not only the first message, the second message, three message, it gives you all the answers basically in one shot. For all distributions. All independent distributions in this case. So if you want to take a look at closer, so it's very difficult to see how fast it's converging. How fast are these things converging? Uh, it may be difficult to see. So what I've shown you here is the difference between the teeth message rate reduction functional and the infinite message rate reduction functional, where black means smaller than 10 to the power of minus 5, some arbitrary number I picked, and uh, bright means larger than that, essentially. So as you can see, uh, after the first message, there's a whole range of values for which there's no change. Okay. So here, in this case, you can show, you can prove that one message is optimum. For all the PQ values here, you can prove it. You can also prove that for all the PQ in this line, the rate reduction function will not change after two messages. So it's optimum. Two messages are optimum here, and so forth. So basically, but if you look along this line, uh, where uh, P is equal to Q and less than half, okay, it seems that it keeps going on forever. So it seems that you can prove uh, that for infinite messages, you need infinite messages for these points. But I don't have a proof for that. Sorry, yes? 0.15 on this picture. So 0.5 will be like middle here, 0.5 will be here. So this is like 0.5. So I think it becomes very light here. You cannot see it. But I think all these lab points here, uh, along those points, for those distributions, you will need infinite messages. 
Yes, so the one which is slowly going up in blue, this, this blue here, is along this point here, basically. Yeah, exactly. Some more empirical observations. Uh, if you, uh, from a practical point of view, how do you compute this? You discretize the P and Q axis. You discretize into N cells, for example. So the resolution of the error is 1 over N. Um, so to compute the convex hull uh, of N points, you know, it's the N log N. Uh, if you use linear programs to do this. Um, and we also find that uh, as you keep doing this concavification uh, with many, many iterations or uh, messages, they saturate because of the discretization step size. Uh, so if you discretize the grid after some point, the error doesn't decrease anymore. It reaches the saturation of value. Uh, again, open problems would be, can you show that these error flows exist as a function of discretization step size? The other question is, how do these error flows change as you make the grid size finer and finer and finer? Uh, we find that this uh, decreases quadratically, but again, that's an open problem to prove that indeed it's quadratic in convergence, for example. So for example, what I've shown you here is the error flow on the uh, x-axis, uh, with the y-axis plotted against the um, sort of computation time, uh, which is a measure of the grid size, essentially. So you, you have some kind of a quadratic decrease. So all this is empirical in nature at this point, uh, not proved. But the expressions that we derived are proved. Um, I'm going to skip this because uh, it turns out that you can generalize these ideas not only for a lossless computation, but also for computation with distortions. Um, so again, it was similar characterization, except that the characterization now involves not only the, the distribution, but also the distortion levels dA and dB. And you can come up with a similar kind of a characterization for the infinite message limit. And you can have an alternative concavification algorithm and so forth. Uh, I won't get into that. So how much time do I have? OK, so in this uh, four minutes, uh, let me do two things. Let me just work out an example of the board, and you can help me uh, work through this example. And then I will conclude with some open problems. Okay. So let's try to do the following computation. So once again, x is independent of y. x is Bernoulli p, and y is Bernoulli q. And this time, Bob wants to compute x and y, and Alice wants to compute y. Okay, so I want to work out, go to the mechanics of this, and see if I can derive the infinite message rate reduction functional for this uh, by following the procedure. Okay, so let's uh, start with t equals zero, the zero message uh, rate reduction functional. The question is. Uh, if I draw here on the x-axis and y-axis here, say let's say this is uh, P and Q. So the question is, so what choices of uh, P and Q is uh, it possible to compute these functions, both the functions, uh, without any messages? So clearly, if I did not have Y, if I did not have Y, we already did the computation, right, for the AND function. Hmm? Yeah. So basically, if I take the AND function we already saw, so maybe. This one is better, I guess. So this is a boundary here on which the AND function is computation is possible without any messages, right? For all these P and Q, it's possible to compute the AND function along this boundary. What about the Y? If I just look at Y, for what values of P and Q is it possible to comp for Alice to compute Y without knowing Y? Zero and one, right? Exactly. So when uh, 
when q is 1 or you know, q is 0, both these things are there. If I intersect these two uh, sets, if I intersect, intersect the blue set with the, all the blues are very visible, the blue set with the uh, red set, I essentially get the following points. I get a point here, the point here, and then I get this line. Right? So let me just keep that for now. So these are the only, uh, only points at which you can do it. Now what's the rate reduction functional along this? So it'll be a binary entropy function like this at this point because it's going to be simply h of p. So this is h of q. So q is equal to 0 on, along this line. So h of q is 0, it's simply h of p. Here it's going to be 0 and 0, right? So basically the 0 message, so this is rho 0 of pq. So what I've shown you here is a rho 0 of pq. So now next step is uh, how do I, so it's not concave with respect to p and q, how do I concavify it? So let me start uh, concavifying it. Okay, so if I send a message from A to B, I go along this direction and concavify with respect to P. So obviously, when I concave, this is already concave, nothing to do here. All this is uh, equal to um, minus infinity, right? Nothing that I can do here. But I can make this zero, okay? Then I send a message from B to A, so I concavify with respect to Q. So if I fix this point, if I concavify this, I get this line. Get this line, and then what about the remaining points? I have to join every point here to the corresponding point here. So I get all these, the surface, right? You can work out the equation of this line, right? Because the height at any point here is p, h of p, and this is like a linear function. So in fact, it's going to be, just make sure, yeah, it's going to be 1 minus q times h of p. Because when q is equal to uh, 1, it's 0. When q is equal to 0, you get h of p. So it's a linear function joining those two points. Now you check, is this concave with respect to port p and q individually? It's concave with respect to q, clearly it's linear. And it's concave with respect to p because the entropy function is linear. So you are, you are done. So in two messages, you've shown the two messages is optimum for this problem. Two messages is optimum for this problem. And the infinite message rho infinity is equal to rho 2 of pq, and that's equal to 1 minus q times h of p. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For the, for the case beta. Exactly. In fact, any two functions which are the exact same rho zero functional will have the same rho infinity functional. So you can have an equivalence class of all functionals which have exactly the same expression also. So you can also do this, uh, you can also use that to answer equivalence classes of function computations. But, but, uh, but the independence is important. Okay, so, so the example I'm doing is for independence. No, but I mean the, the characterization. No, it is for even for joint, distri joint distributions. But the characterizing, uh, that is will be harder because you have to fix the conditional distributions and concave if I have respect to marginals, it's a bit more involved thing. So we don't have any simple ex examples for that situation. So anyway, so, so I hope you can, uh, you at least you got the mechanics of doing this. So if, if you are given a problem, you can start using this procedure to compute the infinite message rate reduction functionals. So let me end by going towards the open problems. So, so some obvious immediate questions arise. Uh, can we uh, compute similar explicit closed form analytical expressions for other classes of independent sources at least? Start with independent sources, but for not just the case when function has to be computed at only one end, or the same function has to be computed at both ends. What about different combinations of and and or? For example, this is one example. But can we do it for all possible combinations? I still don't have an answer to all possible combinations, okay? For example, and and or at one end. 
But I think it's still possible to work it out in, uh, through the same framework. Uh, General function, obviously, it's even harder, and not just you know, uh, 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 at, at the same function, and then combinations of general functions. Okay, so, and you can then the next question would be to go from independent sources to dependent sources. Problem becomes even harder now, but at least can you focus on independent Boolean sources? I mean, uh, in, uh, Boolean functions, and see if you can do it for you know, dependent cases as well, and general functions. Yes. 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 That's right. And uh, now the other questions, other open problems with respect to the concavification algorithm itself. Uh, one is to show the existence of the error bar. The other one is to show that uh, uh, how does the uh, how fast does it converge as a function of the grid size, and so forth. And then um, the rate of convergence of the error uh, flow. And uh, one uh, interesting question is, can you prove that there exists a P and Q in this range where you actually do need infinite messages? OK, I still don't know the answer to this question, but it's, uh, it seems that it should be answerable within the framework of this kind of a construction. Um, going back to the questions which came up at the beginning of this talk about the, tech, uh, the technicalities about interchanging the limits of you know, n going to infinity and t going to infinity, I, I, open question is, do things change if the orders are changed in some way? And can we characterize it? Or it, are they going to be the same? Okay, I don't know. Uh, another question is the following. So this characterization is functional in nature. Functional meaning that I give the whole surface. The whole surface. And it seems that in order to compute it for one point, I would do the whole surface. Is it possible to modify this construction in such a way that for any particular point I give you, a particular P and Q, can you answer the question how many messages you need for this particular P and Q without having to do the, do the whole surface construction? Still don't know. Um, OK, so this last point wouldn't make sense because I couldn't cover the sort of the framework for how we derive these results. And uh, so basically, I would like to conclude now uh, by saying that uh, I hope I at least showed you a, uh, what the ultimate limit is. I defined the problem and showed you what the ultimate limit is. It's a characterized through a functional characterization, which involves this uh, doubly concave functional uh, with respect to the marginal distributions. I showed you that it is possible to do it for any Boolean function um, at one end or both ends. And in fact, as a concavification algorithm, from a practical point of view, to compute these kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I think at this point, I'll just stop because the remaining two bullets uh, I couldn't get to. Thank you. <laughs>